I don't see how three countries basically taking over the running of the game can make the game any better. A lot of countries have struggled since those changes have taken place. England and Australia both join join hands with India and, you know, let's get our snouts in the trough as well. I just can't see how it's good for the game. Uh, I think it's just more of self-interest. They are three snakes of cricket. You've got to take their neck off. You've got to chop their head off. Otherwise, cricket will not survive. There's a heat wave in London and the crowds are basking in the sun watching the first Ashes test in Wales being beamed onto a big screen near Tower Bridge. Over the Thames at Lords, preparations are underway for the second test. In the long room, tables are laid and in the empty dressing rooms, yesterday's century makers await the achievements of today's test players. Ever since England lost at home to Australia in 1882, the Ashes have held a special place in test match history. But under the watchful gaze of the legends of the game, storm clouds are gathering. There's not even a sense anymore about test cricket being the ultimate form of the game. Test cricket is kind of like being treated like an ailing mother to whom you periodically pay um, duty visits uh, for form's sake. And we might end up with test cricket being confined to three, maybe four, maybe five nations over the next decade. Some of cricket's biggest names are warning that the oldest form of the game is now under threat. It seems now that everything is the bottom line. You know, if it's good for the bottom line, then it's good. If it's not good for the bottom line, then it's no good for the game of cricket. Well, that's rubbish. I mean, OK, I understand they need a lot of money to run the game, but you've got to have a balance between bringing in a lot of money and what is in the best interest of the game. There are too many people running cricket that are only interested in the bottom line. They're not interested in the product. They're interested in what the product can produce. And you cannot keep on doing that and expect the product to be good. On the opening day of the Ashes Test at Lords, members of the MCC are queuing up to reserve the best seats before play begins. But even among the staunch traditionalists here, there are mutterings in the ranks about the way world cricket is governed. Too much money is going to too few of the test playing nations, i.e. India, England and Australia. You must offer more cricket to more people around the world. It's a shocker. Some of those lesser teams ought to be given the opportunity to aspire to it and sample what it's like. Lords is the home of cricket, home of the game's most famous club, the MCC, and for thousands of cricketers and hundreds of thousands of fans, the venue which more than any other enshrines the spirit of the game. But it's the spirit of the game which is now under threat, from corruption, match-fixing and plain bad governance. The task of setting that straight now lies with the body most under fire, the ICC, and with its three most powerful members, India, England and Australia. Last year, in an audacious coup, the big three led by India seized control of the International Cricket Council's key committees and the way its funds are distributed. The smallest cricketing nations would be the biggest losers. Well, a come up occurred because India did not feel as though it was getting its due at ICC. India was turning aside from its role in the international governance of the game, was increasingly preoccupied with the strength of its own domestic markets, which are huge, and was expecting the rest of the world to pay it tribute. 
it's self-interest because England and Australia make want to make sure that they're getting the big series with India in terms of TV and sponsorship deals. And to the hell, the hell with the rest of the world. What does that do for a future game which is competitive and um, fair? Well, it does nothing because if all the money is going to three countries, then the rest are going to wither and die. Representing Australia in the talks that led to this takeover was former Test cricketer Wally Edwards. I had to say I had a fair part to play in it, and it goes right back to the first day I became chairman of Cricket Australia. I think within four or five days of that, I got on a plane and travelled to India to meet uh, Mr Srinivasan and other BCCI officials. Mr Srinivasan was the president of the Board of Control for Cricket in India, or BCCI. He's now chairman of the International Cricket Council. So not only is he the most powerful man in cricket, he is the most powerful man that there has ever been in cricket. There has never been a greater concentration of personal power in any individual in this game. It is the income that is coming out of this subcontinent that is supporting I ICC events in a very large way. Almost 75 to 80 percent of the income comes from it. In fact, that is what one should be concerned about, that if, for example, tomorrow, there is loss of interest here, then you can't sustain cricket. You can't pay for whatever we are doing now. Mr. For Wally Edwards, the message coming out of India was loud and clear. At that first meeting in uh, no, early November 2011, it was very, very evident to me that India were very uncomfortable with where the ICC was and what they were doing and how they were running the cricket, if you like, and they had a belief that um, three quarters of the money that the ICC was spending was coming from their, their marketplace and that they thought the ICC were wasting money, weren't achieving a lot and would like change. That was problematic for the other countries involved because if India decided to fold its tent and walk away, then the rest of cricket was worth a very great deal less. And England and Australia were faced with the choice. Did they have India inside the tent pissing out or outside pissing in? This implied threat that India might walk away from ICC events altogether was spelled out to England and Australia. The president of ICC said, see what you can do, see what you can flesh out as to how India might become party to it. Because India was saying, well, you can have another ICC commercial rights, but we won't be there. So you're saying, in effect, that India held the rest of the ICC to ransom? No, I, I don't agree with that. I think they certainly had views, but um, I think the reality of life is we, we it was a, a long... Uh, negotiation over a, uh, over a lot of substantive issues and you know and I, in Australia my role I took extremely seriously. In October 2011, one month before Wally Edwards met Mr Srinivasan, the ICC had commissioned a review of its governance. The man who led the review former Lord Chief Justice Harry Wolfe was concerned by what he found. They were giving money to smaller countries and one of the trouble was you got the money if you behaved and what, when I say if you behaved it meant if you fitted in with the idea of one of the big boys and in particular I have to say this India. India was able to dominate because of its huge different financial position. So that was the structure which I felt had to be changed, and that is the structure which, alas, has not been changed. Lord Wolf proposed uh, basically a more open and transparent structure whereby the hierarchy of members was abolished and the ICC achieved genuine independence from its, from its members. While some of Lord Wolfe's recommendations were adopted by the ICC, his key proposals were rejected. Did that report point the way forward for how cricket should be governed? Very much so. Uh, it was a report which was commissioned by the ICC with the approval of the whole board. 
They commissioned the report, what they saw they didn't like, uh, so they dumped it. The minute that the BCCI saw something that they thought potentially usurped their power, their economic veto at ICC, they ran a mile in the opposite direction and they said, we'll come up with a governance system that works for us. While India, England and Australia discussed their plan to restructure the ICC and its finances, other countries were left in the dark. I started getting phone calls from members who had been hearing whispers that something was afoot. There was nothing officially being done by the ICC. It was these three countries who were running this process. There were rumours that they were meeting in Singapore and Australia and other places uh, and were coming up with a plan. So something was certainly up. All their meetings between the big three were secretive and they did not share with anybody else. When the Big Three's blueprint for the future of the ICC was finally unveiled in January 2014, there was consternation among the less powerful test-playing nations. What I read was pretty horrifying for the game, uh, for the governance of the game, and for the future of the game. Instead of standing up to India, England and Australia, again, buckled under. They decided to appease India instead of standing up to it on matters of principle, that all full members are equal. You need strong full members to, for the health of the game. You cannot just have three countries at the elite level and everyone else uh, sort of has been. I was able to get five votes to oppose the big three changes in the ICC constitution. Cricket, I believe, is the... Zakhar Ashraf represented Pakistan in the internal ICC negotiations over money. Five of the test-playing nations, including Pakistan, opposed the Big Three's proposals. Then the bartering began. They offered us, Pakistan, also to become... Instead of having Big Three, let's make it Big Four. You don't oppose us and you join us. Join our bandwagon. <laughs> So, first of all, I was uh, totally opposed to the idea and I didn't want it to become a party to uh, any uh, gang, I would say, which could take away all the uh, media funds from the ICC and leave all other nations getting poorer in their revenues. So I didn't want it to join them. In his report delivered two years earlier, Lord Wolfe had warned against richer ICC members using the offer of tours to influence voting on the board. Now it's claimed they were doing just that. What they were promised was, if you sign this, we, England or Australia or India, we'll tour you. And because we tour you, uh, you will generate money out of the t television income and sponsorships and so on. It was, and if you don't fall in line, we will not uh, tour you. How were they persuaded to fall in line? By promised good things. <laughs> that, that's how it works. If you don't join us, we'll just ostracize you and you won't get what we can give you. It's as simple as that. I know a lot of countries that are against the takeover. They voted against it initially and then everyone just went to them individually and said, listen, if you come with us, this is what you can get. This is what you will get. And eventually, they all fell in line. I've worked very, very hard to make sure that the smaller nations are not disadvantaged in any way uh, in this process. And uh, I, think, I think what we've come out with is a very productive uh, arrangement. I thought it was particularly unfortunate that the changes that took place subsequently were three of the members coming together and using their muscle to make changes which were not in the interests of, the, of those who play, play those countries that play cricket. And uh, that, that was, uh, that what I thought was regrettable. Lord Wolfe's call for the ICC to be headed by an independent chairman with three independent directors on the board was rejected. 
Instead, they arranged for the ICC to be chaired by India's nominee, Mr. Srinivasan. The chairman of the ICC can represent his country at the ICC while chairing the ICC. So there's a huge conflict of interest. There's a conflict there where the board will sit and each person who's sitting at that board table will act in the interests of their constituents back home. Whereas the ICC, its charter is to operate for the global interests, not the individual interests of the full members. It's just a massive conflict. I don't see how it can work. And that's why the Wolf Report called for independence on the board. It's, it's quite frankly a no-brainer, but not in the world of cricket. If the question is, do directors act in the interests of their own boards or nations? Maybe. But the fact is, you represent your board at the ICC. Are you expected then to go to that board and then say, I forget my, the board that sent me? You know? So I think there's a fine balance there. What did Paul Keating say many, many years ago? Always back self-interest because you know it's a goer. And that, that would sum up uh, world cricket. Can you give us a minute to the meeting, please? No, I think there's a press release maybe. The tactics employed by the big three worked. And in February 2014, the ICC board approved their plans. Uh, I think it was a very good meeting and... Uh... A comprehensive briefing was promised to the media. It's agreed, is it? The, the... Of course. But the formula for the new financial deal remains opaque. We're all happy. Everybody. Well, it is behind closed doors. I mean, nothing about the ICC is remotely transparent. Decisions take place that not even the full member countries go about, and this is no exception. As far as the financial uh, arrangements were concerned, members were told very bluntly that this is a take it or leave it, we're not going to explain to you how we arrive at these numbers. Unbeknownst to the other seven full member countries and the other 90 countries who are either associate or affiliate members, this became an attempt to restructure root and branch the game's finances, whereby the three biggest nations could extract additional rewards in return for what were called their contribution costs. The fact that they are so materially significant to uh, the finances of cricket entitled them to an enormously enhanced dividend. In the next eight years, ICC events, including the World Cup, are expected to harvest record revenues of at least $2.5 billion. The big three will take the lion's share, with India alone netting upwards of $500 million. England and Australia will share around $300 million. In contrast, many ICC members will receive just a few hundred thousand dollars a year each to develop cricket in their countries. I think this is going to ruin the international cricket. So, I don't know what kind of uh, justice is this to the money and to the international cricket. And there's another thing I feel very strongly, that uh, cricket should not follow the money. Money should follow the cricket. Please don't destroy the international cricket because money is not the answer to the game. I don't see how three countries basically taking over the running of the game can make the game any better. I don't see how three countries getting most of the funds out of the game. And countries that don't really need that much funding can make it any better. A lot of countries have struggled since those changes have taken place and I don't see how it can be of any great help. Is it fair that India, the richest cricketing country in the world, receives the lion's share of the revenue? If I'm to be very frank, see, one must look at it from the point of view that uh, India is contributing at, at the moment, in this cycle, uh, almost 75 to 80 percent of the, of the income is coming out of India. Now, to criticize that, I don't think is good. That money, somebody is, is uh, putting on the table, isn't it? If he was not there, you don't have, you know, you, you have hardly 10, 20% of it. 
So I think one should look at it positively and encourage India to bring more money to the table. India now stands at the centre of the cricketing world and India holds the future of cricket in its hands. Few outside India appreciate the place that cricket holds in the hearts and minds of the nation. We're not talking simply about a game here, we're talking about a cause, we're talking about a culture, we're talking about politics, we're talking about economics, we're talking about enormously broad and deep social connections. India's BCCI owes its financial supremacy to a sporting revolution which took place in 2008, the formation of the Indian Premier League. The IPL was a broadcaster's dream, a breathtaking mix of 2020 cricket, huge stars, energetic cheerleaders and a big dash of Bollywood to boot. It launched in April 2008 with probably the greatest razzmatazz of any cricket attraction in history. And it was, from the first, enormously successful. The television rights were sold for enormous sums. Entrepreneurial investors were attracted to it, sponsors supported it in enormous numbers, and the public was absolutely captivated. One of the reasons why the IPL is so popular is because, unlike international cricket, which is inherently unpredictable, domestic T20 cricket always involves India. India always wins. It's a guaranteed income, and naturally, broadcasters and sponsors absolutely love that idea. I now welcome on stage Mr. Lalit Modi. The man behind the IPL was the marketing genius Lalit Modi. Mumbai, I hope you're having fun. The IPL belongs to India's cricket board, the BCCI, and Lalit Modi had a dual role as IPL commissioner and the BCCI's vice president. And thank you for being part of it and making it a reality for all of us. They must have been exciting times. It was very exciting times. We were rolling, you know, it was a new product. Nothing had, like this had ever been done before any sport. In a culture which didn't support club culture, I went against all the marketing gurus. But in my heart, I knew that the, what the fans wanted. I knew the pulse of the nation. I knew what the advertisers were looking for, what were hungry for. And I, need, and I think everybody in our country wanted something to latch on to and identify with. 240,000 welcome the Chennai Super Kings. 290,000. In Modi's IPL, players like MS Dhoni were sold at auctions to the highest bidder for enormous sums. I have 300,000. The IPL didn't just create a bonanza for the teams, players and broadcasters, it also created a fortune for the BCCI. How much money has the BCCI made out of the IPL? We had $8 million in the bank when I joined. The day I left, it was a, a $7.8 billion. But it wasn't just India's cricket board that profited from the IPL. So too did the current ICC chairman, Mr. Srinivasan, who in 2008 was treasurer of the BCCI. At the time, the rules were clear. No office holder of the BCCI could bid for an IPL franchise. But that didn't stop Mr. Srinivasan and his company India Cements from successfully acquiring the Chennai Super Kings. They changed the rules for him. They said, with the exception of the Indian Premier League and the Champions League, specifically clearing Srinivasan of a conflict of interest. It is bizarre that anyone can be kind of retrospectively immunised from a conflict of interest by their own organisation. All decisions have been jointly taken by the government. Relations between Mr Modi and Mr Srinivasan soured. And in 2010, in a sensational move, Lalit Modi was fired as IPL commissioner by the very body he had massively helped to enrich, the BCCI. I will present all the facts of all these allegations. The IPL almost outgrew the BCCI in the course of those early seasons and courted enormous resentment. Modi had this air of glamour, uh, this air of wealth, this self-perception as a man of the people, 
And I think a lot of people in Indian cricket felt rather threatened by that and felt as though he had to be put back into his box. When the axe fell on you, was that a terrible shock? I was seeing already a lot of the people ganging up on me. Um, they were upset that I was getting the limelight. They were upset that I was a brand. It was a big change. And the old boys club didn't like it. Mr Srinivasan accused Mr Modi of rigging bids at an IPL franchise auction and misappropriating funds in a television deal. Mr Modi strongly denies the allegations, but in 2013, the BCCI banned him for life from cricket administration in India. Srinivasan is a ruthless individual, extremely effective, extremely bright, a mind like a steel trap. And he is able to cast into the wilderness anyone who threatens him or opposes him, someone like Lalit Modi, who has you know, created the IPL. What's your view of Mr Modi? I never discuss, I've always maintained that I don't respond to him and I don't talk about him. Do you give Mr Modi credit for launching the IPL so successfully? I give credit to the Indian cricket supporter and the players who made it a success. Would you like to see him return to cricket administration? No. The BCCI's unproven allegations of wrongdoing continue to haunt Lalit Modi, but he now casts himself as a crusader for clean sport. He says the proof of this is that when he worked in cricket administration in India, the underworld tried to have him assassinated. There's not a single game that I know that was fixed in those days. And testament to that is the very fact that the mafia went after me, uh, that controlled betting, they tried to take, take me out four times. Last week, the stakes were raised when a warrant for Mr Modi's arrest was issued in India over money laundering allegations which he denies. The warrant, which Mr Modi says he hasn't received, was issued at the request of India's Economic Intelligence Agency, the Enforcement Directorate. I can guarantee you right now, we did nothing wrong. If they want me to appear, I will appear. I will appear in the UK in front of the, the enforcement, as required, they can come here, take my statements, and I will give what was available to them. After sacking Modi, Mr Srinivasan was elected president of the BCCI, becoming the most powerful man in Indian cricket. <laughs> but two years later, an IPL scandal erupted, threatening to bring him down. Three players from the Rajasthan Royals team were arrested and accused of spot-fixing. How much fixing goes on in the IPL? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, well, it depends on who you speak to. Um, if you speak to me, I'm a cynic, and I'll tell you a hell of a lot goes on. Um, you'll talk to people perhaps in the BCCI, and they'll say, oh, we've got it taped. Um, the reality is that there's so much money which can be made on the IPL, and we're talking billions of dollars, that it, it's, it's almost impossible to give a tournament a clean bill of health. <laughs> Mr Srinivasan would soon become personally embroiled in the investigation. A week after the spot-fixing scandal broke, his son-in-law, Gurunath Mayapan, was arrested and accused of laying bets while in charge of the Chennai Super Kings. Betting in India is illegal, and while the IPL brings in huge commercial revenues, vast sums are wagered in the black economy. Close to $45 million is bet on every single IPL match. Now, if you multiply that by about 60, so you get close to a quarter of a billion dollars being bet on IPL tournament alone. There's estimates at about 100,000 illegal bookmakers in India. When you consider there are a billion people in India and you've got that number of bookmakers and the average bet is about $2,000, you have, 
you to have just a vast, untamed beast. When the scandal erupted, Mr Srinivasan faced protests demanding he resign. He refused, denying that his son-in-law had an official role with the Chennai Super Kings. But a Supreme Court judicial inquiry found otherwise. Did he confirm that his son-in-law, Mr Mayapan, was the team principal of the Chennai Super Kings? No, he did not. Did you believe Mr Srinivasan? Did he tell you the truth? Well, what we believed, we have summed up in our report. He described Mr. Mepin as a mere team enthusiast. We found that he was much more than that. I think as far as his participating as an owner, there was an implied consent. He knew that he was participating, certainly. In March last year, India's Supreme Court asked Mr. Srinivasan to step aside as BCCI president, describing his attempts to stay on as nauseating. He was required to stand down as president of the BCCI. Why was that? Because BCCI manages the IPL. BCCI is directly associated with IPL. It's a domestic tournament of BCCI. And IPL is a subcommittee of BCCI. So that's why if you remain the BCCI president, then there will be conflict of interest. That's why we had asked him to step aside. There was a clear conflict of interest. See, Wasn't the conflict there? of interest is, see, the issue is that it has now been decided by the Supreme Court that there is a conflict. Fine, we accept it. We are not challenging that. We, we, we accept it, fine. You, you say this is so, we'll abide by it in all humility. But that was that it was not so clear earlier. It was not clear by the court earlier. So when the court said it, fine, we accepted it. Mr. Srinivasan stepped down, but in July last year assumed an even more powerful role as chairman of the International Cricket Council. But still the scandal wouldn't go away. Last month, India's Supreme Court banned his son-in-law, Gurunath Mayapan, from cricket for life. Gurunath Mayapan is not only found to have indulged in batting, but his act is also found by the Supreme Court to have an adverse effect on the image of the BCCI, IPL and game of cricket and brought each one of them to disrepute. He is suspended for life from being involved in any type of cricket matches. And you have autographs from greats like... Sachin. Ravi Sawani is a former head of the anti-corruption units at both the ICC and BCCI. It's more special because India won... The he led the investigation into the IPL scandal. All participated in the Cricket World Cup. As far as Mr. Mayapan is concerned, certainly it is the right decision. There's no doubt about it that he should have been given the harshest punishment. And him receiving a life ban from cricket uh, definitely is something which was he deserved, uh, maybe more. The Supreme Court also suspended Mr. Srinivasan's company, India Cements, the franchisee of the Chennai Super Kings, from the IPL for two years, finding it had brought the game into disrepute. There is no doubt that there is a vicarious responsibility on the franchise owners to ensure that um, nobody who has any questionable character comes anywhere close to the uh, team. Millions of people who are true lovers of the game feel cheated. Moreover, this repute has been brought to the game of the cricket, the BCCI and the IPL to such an extent now that now doubts abound in the public consciousness about whether games are clean or not. Mr. Srinivasan now says he has nothing to do with the team. The order was to suspend your team, Chennai Super Kings, for two years from the IPL. Excuse me, not my team. But you had a majority shareholding in the company, didn't you? I had a stake in the India Cements Limited and um, as far as the Chennai Super Kings now is concerned, whatever stake would come as a result of that would go into a trust for the benefit of ex-players of India Cement. So I will have nothing to do. I have nothing to do with it. I have, I'm severed from the Chennai Super Kings. 
Mr. Srinivasan's power base remains firmly fixed in Tamil Nadu and its capital city, Chennai, where we went to interview him. But the most powerful man in cricket remains reluctant to be drawn on matters close to home. Can I ask you about Mr. Gurunath Mayapan? No, because... you may not ask because he did not have... I think in this interview, I must make one thing very clear, that I am not interested to answer anything about Mr. Gurunath Mayapan. There are now calls for Mr. Srinivasan to step down as ICC chairman. He should be fired, not step down. The sad thing is, that the Supreme Court in India has made it absolutely clear that Mr. Sindhivasan is not acceptable as chairman of the BCCI. He's already not there. I think the word they use is abhorrent. But yet, ICC in its wisdom finds that he's a totally suitable person to run the ICC. Uh, that begs the question on the judgment of the people who support him. Should he step down? Well, I don't believe so. You know, I don't believe, as I understand it, I, I think he's already divested all his interest in the Chennai Super Kings, so he, he has no shareholding there at all anymore. So he retains the full support of the board? Absolutely. Yeah, I've, absolutely. Some critics say that your position as chairman of the ICC is now completely untenable. Do you agree with that? I do not agree with that. And I do not know who has been speaking to you. But whatever it is, it is not uh, untenable. And I think it's unfair to put it to me like that. When I persisted with these questions, Mr. Srinivasan ended the interview. Can I ask you this? Because this was raised by Mr. Rajiv Shukla when I spoke to him. I'm not here to... Excuse me. Can we stop for a second, please? Because I think... No, I'm not... Well, let me ask you one more question, Mr. Srinivasan. I'm not... OK, thank you, Mr. Srinivasan. From his base in London, Lalit Modi sends his messages to the world in a flood of combative, provocative tweets, almost all of which are designed to discredit his long-time enemy, Mr. Srinivasan. So what is his ultimate ambition? What does he want to achieve by all this disruptive activity? Well, the simplest answer to that would be revenge. And it depicts the two greatest nations in test cricket, England and Australia. And if you go into each and every little element of this painting, you will find the story of the battle of cricket and the gentleman's sport, and you'll find the legends Special not because it's cricket alone. One of Lalit Modi's most it's prized possessions is this painting, signed by members of the England and Australia teams. Number two, it depicts the love of my life, which is cricket. And it depicts the greatest thing in cricket is the ashes. Lalit Modi has told Four Corners that he now has a blueprint to establish a rival breakaway body to the ICC with rival Test and T20 competitions. 2009, when everything was above board. And Sasha Jaffrey... We could take on the existing establishment, no problem. It requires a few billion dollars. I don't think it would be a problem to get that either uh, into, into action. But it could be done. Have you got players on board? That's the easy part, because it is for the players. The ICC is not for the players. And for me to get players on board would be a switch of a button. There was a report that ran um, in, in the front of the Australian newspaper said, $100 million paycheck for two of your players. I think that's an easy check to write. I'll just put it this way. I said that would be an easy check to write. And if that check is easy to write, then it's a, would I get the players or not is a question you should ask the players, not me. Around the world, growing anger is being felt at the ICC being run by a club of three nations. They are three snakes of cricket. You've got to take their neck off. You've got to chop their head off. Otherwise, cricket will not survive. And already the consequences for cricket are becoming clear. As the number of tests being played gradually declines, so too will the number of nations competing in the showpiece finals of the ICC's biggest event, the World Cup. 
In 2019, the number has been cut from 14 to 10. Ireland's team, which did so well at this year's World Cup, could miss out next time as a result. We're angry that the next World Cup is 10 teams. It doesn't seem to make any sense to us. It's also against maybe what the ICC have done in the last 15 or 20 years because they've put a lot of money into developing countries outside the sort of elite 10. It'll be shattering for those guys who've grown up playing cricket, where cricket's probably not the biggest sport in that particular country, and their dream is to play in a World Cup, and now that's been taken away from them. And that cannot do anything for the development of cricket within that country. How that is in the global interest of the game is beyond me. Just don't understand. The boys playing cricket on the beach in India don't care how their game is governed. <laughs> Neither do the kids playing cricket on grass in Australia. But the battles now being fought behind closed doors will determine the future of their game. Given the staggering weight of money now being generated in world cricket, it's difficult to see how anything but cold, hard cash is going to dictate the future of the game. Next week, how the ghosts of the CIA's controversial torture program continue to haunt the United States. Until then, good night.